All right, welcome everyone to the next edition of our Mean Curvature Flow Seminar on Surgery. The next speaker is uh, Adam Thompson. He's going to talk to us about second fundamental form. Take it away, Adam. Um, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, so this week I'm just going to pick up roughly from where Marcus left off. Um, so I'll go through that. So I'll just remind everyone of where we are first, and then I'll go into what I want to do this week. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so right now we're just working. We have closed n-dimensional manifold, um, closed being compact without boundary. Um, and I'm gonna start off with just some initial data. Um, and by this, I mean just an initial embedding um, into Rn plus one. Let's move. Okay. Um, and of course, the problem that we're interested in solving is just mean curvature flow. So, family. Settings. Rn plus one. Um, okay, so this moves by mean curvature flow. And I'm gonna, from now on, um, just abbreviate this MCF. If we have the following equation, so I want my time derivative. going in the direction of the mean curvature vector, Tx. Sh, Tx, where this new, of course, is my outward pointing of the normal vector field. Okay, let me just, and of course, I want the initial map to match up with my initial data. Okay, let me just label. MCF. Yeah. And where we got to last week with Marcus was we got our short time existence and uniqueness. Okay, so theorem. Given the above. You can find some little epsilon bigger than zero such that there's a unique F um, solving, solving our problem. Um, I should say on this interval, on zero epsilon. Okay, um, so, so far we can take our initial data and then we can find some possibly very small number on which we can solve mean curvature flow. Okay, um, and then the goal for this week is to take this possibly very short living mean curvature flow and say, in fact, we have some mean curvature flow defined on a maximal interval of existence. And we want to characterize what happens to the mean curvature flow as we approach this maximal time um, that we can define it. Okay, so main theorem for today, main theorem. It's the following. So given the Rn plus one um, as above, what can I say? Um, okay, so I can say there exists a unique solution of the curvature flow. And it's going to be defined on this interval zero to capital T. And find on maximal existence 
Um, of course, with our initial condition with F0. And moreover, our maximal existence time. Okay, so the maximal is characterized by our curvature blowing off. Okay, so the maximal existence time um, is characterized by lim soup. So I go to T. My second fundamental form is going to diverge to infinity. Okay, um, so we don't actually a priori see all of the derivatives of this curvature flowing up, we're going to see that basically throughout, if our second fundamental form stays bounded during mean curvature flow, all of its derivatives stay bounded during mean curvature flow. Um, so yeah, this, this blow up of just the second fundamental, second fundamental form um, is what's going to characterize it not being able to exist for any, any longer. Um, Okay, so I guess what I was saying there is um, so question. So why why star? My answer. So if star isn't true, if I can bound my second fundamental form. Um, on some interval, then we, I can extend my flow past that. Um, and I guess to me, when I was reading through, this was kind of the important property of the proof. Basically, we see that if the second fundamental form is bounded, um, then yeah, I can continue flowing under mean curvature flow. Um, and that's why we get that characterization. Okay, and then I'll just kind of draw some pictures. Um, so I guess our canonical example or the most boring example um, is our shrinking spheres. Of course, these are kind of homogeneous. So curvature is the same. It's not especially interesting, um, but as our sphere shrinks, the curvature looks kind of like one on R squared, or perhaps it's um, one on R for the second fundamental form, which as our radius goes to zero, is of course gonna um, diverge plus infinity. Um, a perhaps kind of more interesting picture is these dumbbell shaped things. Um, but again, so when, these guys hit their singularity. It's specifically at this neck pinching region. And as that happens, you have like your little cylindrical looking region here, I guess. And the curvature here is going to blow up. Um, so again, you get that. And perhaps when you're just looking, so if the curvature everywhere on a shape is bounded, I guess the intuition is that you still have kind of smooth shape that you could work with. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try argue that if our curvature remains bounded, um, as we approach the time, that endpoint, then we converge to a hypersurface and we can just restart the mean curvature flow there and nothing goes wrong. Um, and if we just kind of put these two mean curvature flows back together, everything's smooth and we just continue on um, yeah, throughout. Okay. So. Okay. So. So I'm going to have my me coach flow and plus one. Hold. And 
there exists C. Um, yeah, so perhaps like in these pictures I've drawn above, it could be misleading um, that we might not necessarily um, get something so catastrophic going on, but perhaps we could drop regularity or something, you know, um, uh, like one of the higher derivatives of the second fundamental form could blow up and that could kind of damage our mean curvature flow. Um, and the main idea or the main property here is that actually can't happen. So if I bound my second fundamental form on some time interval, then I can actually find some constant. Um, it's gonna depend on the dimension, this initial bound and on the maximal time. Um, roll in such that these covariant derivatives um, are also bounded. And not just that, on this time interval um, where I have the bound, that bounded and there's this decaying T as well. Label these quickly. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and to see kind of why this is holding, so assume start down here. Assume that I have this bound on the second fundamental fundamental form. Say then. If I look um, at my mean curvature flow between two points, then by applying this kind of mean curvature flow equation um, and a bit of fundamental theorem of calculus, F T X D T. Um, Okay, so by my equation, because I know F solves mean curvature flow, I can replace this derivative with um, my mean curvature, of course, my unit normal. It's um, magnitude is just gonna not affect this because it's gonna be one, dt. And this mean curvature being the trace of the second fundamental form, I'm gonna get a bound on this trace. A less than equal to that. Okay. And so I can find a constant which bounds this. Um, and this is essentially, right, almost immediately going to tell me that this family of maps whose domain is a compact space, it's just this fixed background manifold M, is uniformly bounded. Um, and equicontinuous. We continuous. Horrific job of spelling that. This. Um, and so I can appeal to Arzella Scully. Arzella. Um, to obtain a continuous limit, okay? So then I get there exists FT mapping M to RN plus one um, such that, so F um, uniformly. So for now, it's just F that's approaching this limit one uniformly. Um, and so, of course, that's not quite enough to conclude what we want to. And so the main bulk of the work here is in showing those derivative estimates on the second fundamental form. 
And as soon as you get the derivative estimates using your mean curvature flow equation um, and some of the other evolution equations that we've seen previously, these translate into bounds on the derivatives of f. And that's where we're starting to get this uniform convergence of not just f, but all of its derivatives. Um, okay. And so once we have that, so short time existence. plus this map ft. Um, this is going to give me some f tilde, um, which is going to map, let's say, from this interval, plus m to or n plus 1 um, with its initial condition. And then we're going to kind of extend extend f by we just run one right after the other okay f t x t t x and t one t x sorry Alan yeah what are you assuming here? What is two stars? Sorry. Oh, that was that my mean curvature or my second fundamental form was bounded. But you you don't want to use the fact that the, the derivatives are bounded also? I will, yeah, so. Because otherwise, how do you know that the FT uh, is smooth? Yeah, to exactly. Start, start so right flow, now, right? yeah, right now, with what I've said here, I just get a continuous FT. What we want is to get a smooth FT and to do this. And so kind of the remainder of my time, what I'm going to be doing is proving that this bound is actually enough that I get three stars for free. And then that gives me my smooth convergence. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, like Ramirez says, so for this to work properly, um, in the sense that F capital T is smooth and we get um, uniform convergence of all our derivatives. We require derivative estimates. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's start estimating some derivatives. Um, okay. So yeah, I've put these derivative estimates as their own theorem as well, um, because they seem to me quite important. Theorem. Okay, so assume that M one six Okay, so we're going to start off by assuming we just have a mean curvature flow. And the only thing that we know about this is that the maximum um, on each time slice of our second fundamental form is bounded and it's bounded uniformly um, in T, so independent of our time. Okay, and so from this and the fact that it solves mean curvature flow, what we can conclude is that for all 
actual numbers, um, I can find some constant. Again, I think I wrote this before, but I'll write it again. So it's worth having it here, um, such that my derivatives are also also bounded. And in fact, I get this for T. Okay. Um, and so I guess as we're quite used to by now, the proof of this is going to involve firstly looking at how um, looking at the evolution equations or the derivatives of the second fundamental form and then applying the maximum principle. Um, Okay, um, and just to remark on, I guess, the notation I'll be using, because it's going to be convenient. Um, so, notation. I have two tenses. Uh, tenses. Then S with this little asterisk, T, um, will denote a linear combination. So not just A, I guess, some, it's perhaps a better, better word, some linear nation um, of contractions. S on T. Um, yeah, so we're going to have a lot of contractions of the second fundamental form and perhaps it's higher derivatives floating around. So it's going to be useful. Um, I should actually say this to be more proper. Contractions of this tense product. Um, yeah, so just with this, for example, if I took my inner product of maybe this derivative, then I could write this like this, um, so that's just a single contraction um, on this derivative on the, on the second fundamental form. Um, I could also say I had h squared plus the norm squared of the second fundamental form. This is a linear combination of contractions of second fundamental form with itself um, As well, just remind you of this evolution of the second fundamental form. So, um, plus a squared a. Uh, so I could also rewrite this using this little asterisk. Doesn't simplify much in this case, um, but I could write it with three second fundamental forms there. Um, so so. Two of them have combined to give me this a squared term, and then there's kind of one left over. Um, yeah, and just immediately kind of from this notation, I guess a convenient thing about it, notice that if I take the norm here, I get a kind of Cauchy-Schwartz type thing happening. Um, maybe that's not, Cauchy-Schwartz isn't the right one. Um, right name, but I get an inequality here. I can bound its norm by some constant times the product of the norms. And it also kind of plays nicely with our covariant derivative. So we get a Leibniz type rule. So this second one um, follows um, pretty much from the normal Leibniz rule and the fact that our metric is parallel with respect to the levy feeder connection. Okay. Yeah, so as promised, we got a Got to compute some evolution. So um, I guess 
if I'm looking, looking to bound the maximum of these derivatives, the natural evolution to look at is going to be the, um, the evolution of this quantity. Or really, I should say the square of it. Okay, so the final. Natural T, A squared is going to be bounded by the Laplacian A squared no, no, no. minus two minus one plus some constant. Um, and then I'm going to have this nice little sum here over terms. So P A Q A move this over. R and another M term. Okay. Um, and I guess when it comes to applying the maximum principle, um, I'm going to do it inductively on M on the order of the derivative. And the nice thing about this final term is that other than this guy at the end, all of these are lower order. So um, as we're going to do it inductively, we'll know already that they're bounded um, and we're going to use that. So that's going to be good. Yeah, so proof. Okay, so step one. Step one is pretty much to be just looking at the tensor formulation. Um, okay, so step one, I want to show, show this except without any norms going on. Um, so just if I take my time derivative, of a um, of this derivative, sorry, then I can commute this to the inside at the expense of this kind of term. So this is where this term's gonna gonna crop up. It's gonna manifest as these linear combinations of contractions. Uh, um, okay, and so the reason this is the case, so I'm just going to note here. Uh, that, so if I do take my time derivative of some covariant derivative of a tense field, um, of course, it would be great if we could just commute them inside, but the metric itself is changing. Um, so that's going to give us a term. So firstly, we do get this plus some covariant derivative of a curvature asterisk with T. But this curvature, because we're in a nice, we're in a hypersurface, we can use our Gauss or Kodazi um, equations to write it in terms of second fundamental form. Okay. And so the proof is essentially just repeatedly applying this um, and collecting the Y terms in the right spot. Okay, so hence, so T, M, A. So if I take out my first one, minus one, then on the right-hand side, um, what I'm gonna get is plus, of course, um, Okay. And then there's this T term, which in our case is an M minus one. Okay. Yeah, and then so you can see already um, that we're getting these terms where the powers or the orders of the derivatives are gonna add up um, add up to M. So essentially we're just gonna keep adding to this each time. Minus two, a 
and this time I get some more, but it's a similar deal. So I get a square, I get A, M minus two, uh, plus, you know, I'm gonna stop writing now because it's all a similar thing. And so if I kept going, I guess I could formalize this as a proper induction. Um, I'm not gonna go to that trouble. I'm gonna see that I'm gonna get this equation star that I wanted. Okay, and then the next part of course is to translate this into a proper kind of time derivative of that norm. Um, yeah, of the norm, okay, so step two. apply this to the thing that I actually want, want to understand. Um, I'm going to start with just classic. And then if I sub, sub this in here, um, okay, yep, yeah, sorry. Um, what I'm going to get in the end M partial T A M A plus some constant um, P plus Q plus R equals M. Um, so actually, I'll get rid of this equality, chuck an inequality in. And this is just going to be me applying um, my remark before about how the norm of two kind of asterisk quantities, I can approximate it. P, A, Q. Okay, um, and just to note that this final um, derivative of the order A is coming from this one on the right-hand side. So I'll get um, the terms adding up to M in this left-hand part. And then on the right-hand part, I get an Mth derivative of A and in total, they're still just linear combinations. And so I've approximated them. Um, and then of course, the next step that I wanna do, is I wanna somehow get rid of this time derivative of A um, conveniently, though we know what the time derivative of the second fundamental form is. Um, I had written it just above. So I know partial T A was this Laplacian term plus I'm just gonna keep with keep it like this because that's all I need. And so really when I use that, I have M derivative Laplacian on the inside. Um, I'm going to keep the same CM, but by applying the kind of the Leibniz type rule to this term, it's just going to, to contribute to this factor. So I'm just going to absorb it in there. Okay. Okay. And so now I guess the issue term is this. I have no idea what this one is. Um, so again, Let's just wash in. Yes, it's with the same. Oh, no, sorry. Getting ahead of myself. Okay, so I get two there. Um, okay, and this time I have this in a product. So two, the first one, I get a Laplacian on the outside. And on the second one, get this more symmetric looking term. Okay, and I'm just gonna recognize this immediately as plus one, 
a squared. Um, okay, so now this is looking pretty good, right? Um, looking pretty similar. Just these terms are differing by a little bit. Um, so yeah, we want to deal with that. But what I'm going to notice is that every time I want to commute a Laplacian past a covariant derivative, I'm going to obtain some kind of curvature term um, because of the Ricci identities. And these curvature terms are actually just going to translate into um, more terms in terms of the derivative of the second fundamental form um, and its derivatives because we got kind of these higher derivative terms. Um, so really, as I commute kind of successively this Laplacian past each covariant derivative, I'm just going to get a term that's going to contribute to this sum in the end. Um, so I won't write that out. Um, yeah, but then rearranging this equation and, um, and subbing it in into this one is what's going to give me this formula that I wanted. So I'll just copy that. So maybe I'll do a little dot, dot, dot. But to get from the one to the other, it's then kind of a clear computation. There's no more tricks. It's just combining two equations. Okay. Okay, so now that we understand how the second fundamental form or the derivatives, um, or I should say the norm of its derivatives are evolving, it's just um, the maximum principle. Okay, so proof of derivative estimates. Yeah. Uh, and so this one is again, so induction on M, M being the order of the derivatives, um, clearly. So it's true for equals zero. It's true in this case by assumption. Um, and then assume it holds up to. So okay, I should say here that then of course, perhaps I should say strong induction, we're going to assume it holds for all integers less than or equal to n. I'm sure it's true for n plus one. Um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to do the first step. So I'm going to show it holds for m equals one. And I'm going to throw out the function that you would want to use for the nth step, kind of for an arbitrary step. But I'm not going to actually work with that because it's a bit messier. Um, the problem, yeah, so let's look at it for m equals 1. Okay, so this one. So what I'm going to define is f. a squared plus some constant, which we'll pick later, times a squared. Okay, so the reason that we don't want to just do it um, for this covariant derivative of a is if we looked at this evolution equation we had before. So evolution equation for a squared is equal to some Laplacian a squared. Sorry, I should say less than or equal to um, minus squared a squared plus constant yep. okay. which I can again because there's just a little negative term in there. I can approximate this. Square. Square. Um, yeah, so we could apply the maximum principle to this um, and we would get something. It's just that something isn't going to be very useful. And the issue is this term. So this is like a bad term, so to speak. Bad term. And what we've done is in this approximation step here, we had this wonderful term 
that we've thrown out. Um, so we want to actually bring that term in and somehow use it um, in our estimates. And so to do that, we're going to define this little function here, which combines covariant derivative of A with this um, square norm of the second fundamental form. Okay, so let's just write out the evolution for F and see, see how that helps. Okay, so from the first term, differentiate my T first plus T times, sorry, I need, a, need an inequality. Um, okay, in the brackets, I have A squared minus two squared A some constant. Um, that was a square. Um, they're there, and then when I differentiate my second term, I'm going to get this Laplacian minus where am I? Yeah, two a some uh, perhaps different constant, but of course. That's not going to cause any major issues. Um, in fact, it's going to cause no issues. Um, yeah, so now here we can see that this term is going to match up. I'm um, sorry, this is squares. These terms are going to match up. And if we pick our K big enough, um, we can actually kill off the bad term. Okay, so just rearranging this. What do I get? I get Laplacian of F. It's coming from these guys. Plus uh, I'm just gonna approximate this one away. It's a negative term, so I'll just kill that one off. Uh, one minus two K times norm A squared. So of course, that's coming from these ones that I'd underlined before in red. Um, and then plus some constant. This, maybe I'll call it C1, it's slightly different to those two, times F. Okay. And so if I choose, so choose K bigger than a half, you can then, of course, approximate this plus CF. Okay. And so that's exactly kind of what we want for our maximum principle. Um, so maximum principle. My max of f at time t is going to be bounded above um, by e to the sum constant t max m naught f. And of course, so this function's increasing. Um, and this is an important remark that I forgot to make at the start. The maximal time, time t is necessarily finite. Okay, in our case, because we were looking at closed manifolds, um, the image is gonna be compact. And so I can always put it inside a sphere of large enough radius. And by the kind of avoidance principle, as my sphere shrinks, I'm going to have to hit um, a singularity in finite time so that I don't kind of, what's the word? Um, so I don't contradict that. Okay. Um, yeah. So this t is less than t, which is less than infinity. That just means that I can bound this c1t max. Okay, um, of course, at time zero, because my F involves T's. So when I wrote F up here, this is gonna go away when T equals zero. I'm just gonna get some multiple of my second, fundament second fundamental form. Um, so I'm just gonna write this as C2. Yeah. So I'm gonna write it as C2 because by assumption, my second fundamental form 
is bounded, of course. And then the left hand side, so left hand side, I have max mt f um, sorry i'm going to be doing my equation in a little bit of a weird way because it's going to be backwards um it's going to be t a mt plus some k mt um and the reason i wanted to do it backwards is because this term is positive and so this is bounded this is bounding this term that i really care about okay that's not equal to um it's less than or equal to c2 of course and so in the end what i conclude after dividing through and these all have square root dividing through and doing my square roots um, I get that bound that I wanted um, of course that's just in the first case um, so for the general one so for general m I had a little bit of a play around in this um, with this the notes that I was looking off um, just gave it as an exercise but it's my belief um, that I would use M equal to T. Uh, I should say this is getting so bounds for less than or equal to M implies bounds for M plus one. Um, so my function, I do a similar trick. This time I have m plus one, a squared, uh, but then here I need like a polynomial in my lower ones, um, or at least the way I was doing it to get my maximum principle to work. Otherwise I just had some random term floating around that didn't get estimated properly. Uh, but then just differentiating this in exactly the same way as I did before, and applying the evolution, um, it goes through, goes through exactly as you would want it to. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. So using those bounds, um, I won't actually write it out, but we get the bounds on the derivatives. So these bounds give bounds on derivatives of f. And so we get that f or the derivatives um, because they work for arbitrarily high m. Um, we get uniform convergence of all our derivatives of f. And using that, we can then argue that the convergence of that f capital T I mentioned at the start is in fact smooth. And um, it defines a proper, you know, an embedding. It's a hypersurface. And so we just restart our mean curvature flow at t. And this extended mean curvature flow extends past um, the supposed maximal time whenever um, the norm of A is bounded. And so that's why we get that characterization. Okay. Thank you. That's um, All right. Thank you, Adam. I don't know. Maybe I'll emoji. <laughs> Uh, there we go. <laughs> ah, um, you. <laughs> you're welcome. Any questions for Adam or comments? What about uniqueness? Uniqueness? Oh, so on each, so as part of Marcus's. Ah, um, okay. So we do uniqueness the short for time. The short uniqueness. time. Okay. Yeah. We already proved it. Okay. So this one is strongly parabolic, right? Sorry. Okay. Um, no. I mean, this is like an example of a smoothing type effect where you have some critical quantity that's bounded and then everything else is bounded as a result. So yeah, it's like a parabolic sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Is the trick with this T the same as you use in say standard heat equation type of bounds? I mean, this, this maximum principle sounds, seems a little bit out of nowhere, right? But it's exactly the same trick you use for Ricci flow for curving trees estimate. I wonder yeah, yeah. if it's I, just the same trick. Of course, I've never learned the, the basic uh, <laughs> theory I went through uh, straight to the Ricci flow, but uh, it's the same trick, yeah. It all yeah. works fine for, for heat equation. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. If you have like a growth estimate, so if you have like a, even like a nonlinear second order equation, but as long as the right hand side has a certain growth, then you can always do this. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's old. I guess it's a really old idea, actually. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where that the idea of putting the T term in is a nice trick. It's, I don't know how old that is in the literature. It might not be all that old. Oh. Um, is it? Someone oh, told me it was classical time. and I always believed them. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, could be. Mm. Um, it's not the way you traditionally do it for the heat equation, but you know, it works nicely there. So. So what, uh, this last bit about convergence of the, the derivatives of f, mm -hmm. um, the, there's a slight subtle, so you, you sort of argue there you can control uh, the nabla k of, of f for any k. But the, the, mm -hmm. you have to be a little bit careful here because the nabla is also changing in time. Ah, so, yes. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit of a mess, all this thing. But what you really need to show is that you can find some fixed connection or maybe fixed metric and so on, and then control the derivatives with respect to that to get the mm. conversion, which is just one extra step on top of what you've done. But yeah, um, actually, that's answered perhaps a question I had because they were <laughs> um, they look at like they first show that the the metric coefficients converge right, um, and that yeah. They're all uniform. Right, the right. Yeah. Is that the reason why? Yeah, that's part of the argument. Yeah, that? that's right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I better run off because I have to. Yeah. All right. Thanks for talking. Okay. Great. All good. Do some functional analysis, but um, yeah, thanks for coming. Um, no worries. All right. Thanks, Adam, again for the really nice talk. Thanks, yeah. Adam. I'll stop the recording. Mm -hmm. Take a look.